Good morning, everyone. Welcome to MIT class of 2012. We also give the warmest welcome to your friends and family who have come to see you off as you begin your MIT adventure. Let me start by explaining the purpose of this convocation. Uh, from the Latin, convocation means literally a calling together. Given the uncontainable energy of any group of 1,000 MIT students, uh, we don't get to call you together very often. Frankly, we start off this way because it's virtually the last time we can call all of you together until you come together again to receive your degrees in four, let me warn you, very short years from now. But now that we've insisted on your attention, I want to use it to give you a sense of the character and spirit that define MIT. And I'm going to sneak in just a little bit of advice along the way. Uh, first, I want to introduce the group that joins me here on the stage. Um, as you know, MIT has about 1,000 faculty members, and it's those faculty members who define the academic and research directions of MIT, and I'll talk about getting to know them in just a few minutes. But in a somewhat different context, you will come to know many of the people gathered here behind me because in many important ways, they define the nature and direction of the undergraduate experience at MIT. Directly or indirectly, they will play powerful roles in your lives over the next four years. Now, in case uh, you find yourselves dealing with any of them in person, I should tell you, first of all, that all of them welcome the opportunity to talk with undergraduates. And second, I should also reassure you that they appear far less imposing when you see them in their street clothes. In this morning's program, you'll hear from only two of them, our chancellor, professor of city planning, Philip Clay, and our vice chancellor, professor, professor of civil and environmental engineering, Stephen Lerman. Now, both of them know MIT not only as administrators and not only as professors, but also as MIT students, because both of them were students here themselves. Also joining us on the stage are the provost, and the Associate Provosts, the Secretary and Vice President for Institute Affairs, the Deans of the Institute's five schools, the Dean for Undergraduate Education, the Chair of the Faculty, importantly, the House Masters of the Undergraduate Residence Halls, and our new Dean for Student Life, Chris Colombo, who, like you, begins his MIT adventure this fall with great excitement and enthusiasm from all of us to all of you, welcome to MIT. Now, the calendar of the college admissions process means that we have, for some fairly long part of this past year, kept all of you in suspense. And then we had the great joy of offering each of you an invitation to enroll at MIT. It's unlikely to be news to any of you that we admitted fewer than 12% of those who applied to MIT last year. And based on that statistic alone, you're probably feeling lucky to be part of this class. But let me reverse the perspective for a moment to be very clear about how we feel about you. It is MIT's very good fortune that you decided to join us. What you bring to MIT is partly individual, your own intellect, energy, ideas, and aspirations, your distinctive life experience and point of view, your language, your culture, and your faith, your imagination, and your sense of humor. But in addition to each of your individual gifts, together you represent the start of a marvelous new chapter in the history of human understanding. And it happens that we've gathered in an unusually interesting place to think about that idea. We sit this morning in this grand grassy space that we call Killian Court. 
the surrounding magnificent buildings, the Bosworth buildings, also called the main group, magnificently embraced the court. And together, the space and these buildings represent the geographic and symbolic center of our campus. Perhaps as important, these great buildings are also a monument to the persistent power of human inquiry, a physical representation of the stone by stone development of humankind's understanding of the world. If you look, at, look up at the frieze on the buildings nearest the river, and you can kind of get a glimpse of some of them from here through the trees, you will see a carved band of names, giants of science and philosophy, mathematics and medicine, architecture, art, and engineering, Aristotle and Archimedes, Newton and Franklin, Darwin and Pasteur, names that mark the miles on the rising road of understanding that led to the modern world. Towering there, those names may seem intimidating, distant, abstract, some in smaller print are embarrassingly obscure. All are decidedly dead. And certainly the list is incomplete. Starkly white, male, and Western. So for a host of reasons then, aren't these intellectual ghosts irrelevant to who you are and why you're here today? I assert, absolutely not because all of them open new chapters in their lives, just like you. They were crazy about math and science, engineering and design, art and philosophy, just like you. And they were hopeful and ambitious and uncontrollably curious, just like you. And even if we cannot all become intellectual giants, we can each add our own stone to the incredible, inspiring, rising edifice of human understanding, just as they did. I want to bring down one name from the frieze today as a way of telling you a little bit about the remarkable history you inherit and about MIT. Leonardo da Vinci's name is among the most familiar. You'll find it on the western odd number side, as you'll come to understand, just over there on Building 1, which houses the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Da Vinci lived 500 years ago, from 1452 to 1519. Can you imagine leaving work behind you that would continue to inspire awe and scholarship 500 years from now, in 2508? Now, Da Vinci was an illegitimate child with very little formal schooling and no one would have expected anything of him in particular. But from decidedly modest beginnings, he built a life of almost incomprehensible achievement. Many think of him mainly as a painter, one of the two or three great masters who defined the highest artistic achievement of the Italian Renaissance, the most celebrated period in all of Western art. Yet in actuality, painting was not how he spent most of his time. Da Vinci worked as a scientist and engineer, a sculptor and inventor, a city planner and architect. The wide range of his interests and talents suggests an embodiment of the ideal of a university, particularly this university. Let me describe for you three of his characteristics that profoundly resonate with MIT. First was Da Vinci's complete disregard for the accepted boundaries between different fields of knowledge. Everything he did fed everything else, interconnecting disparate perspectives. Today we dress up that attitude with an awkward phrase, multidisciplinary thinking. But for da Vinci, it was nothing more than his ravenous curiosity, his desire to explore everything, to explain everything, and to put to use everything he learned. As a scientist, he made painstakingly precise observations of human anatomy, of geology, of the structure of trees, and of the physical properties of water and light. He drew, he recorded, 
He calculated forces, speculated about causes, and experimented over and over to test his ideas. In turn, those studies, that deep knowledge of his subjects, made his paintings leap off the canvas with life. Every muscle, every hillside, every storm-tossed tree, vivid and intoxicatingly real. At the same time, his incredible ability to draw, to think and render in three dimensions, actually made it possible for him to invent, describe, and communicate engineering ideas that were unimaginable before. As an anatomist, he used these methods to diagram the skull and its relation to the brain. As an engineer, he used his scientific grasp of fluid dynamics and geology to design stunningly original canals and bridges. But he also used his engineering knowledge of sediment and flow to perceive in Tuscany's stratified tumbling rock formations a frozen image of violent fluid motion, an intuitive leap that presaged five centuries in advance today's science of plate tectonics. In the same way, much of the exciting work at MIT is happening at the intersections between disciplines, where cancer biology merges spectacularly with the physical sciences, computer science, and nanoscale engineering where climate science and the demand for new energy sources collaborate creatively with economics, political science, history, and the practical realities of architecture and the business world, where neuroscience crosses into artificial intelligence, philosophy, and linguistics. Here at MIT, each of you will find the joy and power of mastering a given field, if you will, the discipline of knowing your discipline. But I hope you'll also pursue your boundless curiosity well beyond the disciplinary boundaries. Because from there, you might well encounter new ideas and fresh perspectives that could take you beyond what has been found before. The second facet of da Vinci's character that aligns with MIT is his respect for and fascination with nature, both as a scientist and an engineer. As he wrote in his notebooks, human ingenuity will never devise any inventions more beautiful, nor more simple, nor more to the purpose than nature does, because in her inventions, nothing is wanting and nothing is superfluous. Contemporary society has a way of separating us from nature in our daily lives. But here at MIT, you'll find a great many engineers and scientists who treat nature as one of their prime collaborators. One example among many I could offer is Angela Belcher, Germishhausen Professor of Material Science Engineering and Biological Engineering and a MacArthur Fellow, among many other honors. Early in her studies, she marveled at how the abalone makes its shell. By adding nothing but a small number of proteins, the abalone transforms calcium carbonate, chalk, a simple, structurally weak compound into an intricately structured material 3,000 times stronger than chalk itself. And the abalone performs this transformation at normal earth temperatures and pressures with no toxic byproducts. So Professor Belcher asked if nature could self-assemble such an extraordinary structure out of such simple ingredients under such benign conditions why couldn't we tap those natural mechanisms to design new materials of our own? As she and her colleagues have now proven, proven in many contexts, we can. For instance, they've engineered benign viruses to self-assemble into a battery, a clear non-toxic film with the potential to coat whatever object might need power, a cell phone, for example. For da Vinci, the simplicity he appreciated in nature became his ultimate standard in design. And as you'll discover here, from robotics to aeronautics, computer science to mechanical engineering, simplicity in design is also very MIT. In fact, Amy Smith in the Department of Mechanical Engineering 
recently published seven rules that guide her work in designing technologies for the developing world, from grain mills to incubators. Her rule number three quotes da Vinci himself. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. The third quality of da Vinci's character that informs our work at MIT is an irrepressible demand for hands-on making, designing, practicing, and testing, and for solving problems in the real world. The inventions he sketched range from the first adjustable wrench to machines for making nails and minting uniform coins, to fortified wagons, steam cannons, and temporary bridges for warfare. His fascination for tackling practical problems echoes the central mission of MIT, to bring knowledge to bear on the world's great challenges. An assignment pursued at MIT with remarkable results, from developing radar during World War II to developing standards for the World Wide Web today. Da Vinci even taught the students in his workshop to follow the principle of demonstration, the same commitment to learning by doing that will define your education at MIT. As he wrote, I have been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. That same spirit animates so much of our work at MIT. You see it in the ingenious modular houses that Professor of Architecture Lawrence Sass designed as an affordable and attractive way to restore the devastated neighborhoods of New Orleans. Whole houses whose construction requires only a mallet to assemble the digitally designed friction fit interlocking pieces. And if you'd like to see one of these houses, one is now on display at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. The urgency of doing is expressed in the innovative batteries that Professor Yetming Chang has created for the next generation of electric cars, a topic you'll more, hear more about from him at his lecture on Tuesday. And that urgency of doing surely drives every aspect of the MIT Energy Initiative. We call it MITEI, an expansive, institute-wide initiative to tackle what may well be the most pressing challenge of our time. 500 years after da Vinci first taught all these lessons, with his multidisciplinary curiosity, his admiration for nature's economy of design, and his irresistible passion for solving problems, he remains an intriguing teacher. And you will also encounter a great many extraordinary teachers at MIT, the most invigorating minds and inspiring mentors you will ever know. Now, just a warning, now we get to the advice part of the speech. If I can succeed in conveying only one piece of wisdom today, it's this, almost invariably, the students who get the most out of their MIT education have come to know well at least one member of our faculty. And I urge you to make that one of your goals for your time at MIT. Perhaps you'll make it a goal of your freshman year. Now, some of you may find it surprising that in truth, this is a very easy assignment. You will meet faculty who teach your classes. I encourage you to accept their invitation to talk with them in their office hours. I hope that each of you, along with about 85% of our undergraduates, will do a Europe, the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program, that offers the chance to engage in cutting edge research with our faculty. You will discover countless other avenues, inside and outside the classes, your classrooms, to get to know our faculty. Over the next four years, you and your classmates will also teach one another there's a good chance that you will never again live and work in a community with as rich an array of different cultures and backgrounds as MIT. You will share your MIT experience with classmates who don't look like you or talk or think like you, which will prepare you well for the global collaborations that will be inevitable in your lives and careers beyond MIT. Now, I'm certain that you've chosen MIT because you discovered that you don't have to look very hard for new intellectual adventures here. You can take a hands-on summer internship in a foreign country through the program we call MISTI. You can hear the Boston Symphony Orchestra or visit the Museum of Fine Arts with free tickets from our Office for the Arts. 
and you can sample classes or activities or travel you've never done before during the independent activities period in January. Be as determined in your curiosity as Leonardo da Vinci, and you will use your time at MIT to its fullest potential. All of you are starting your college education at an uncertain, unsettling time for this country and for the world. But even so, I would say especially so, I believe you will find MIT an inspiring place in which to study, to learn, and to grow. MIT is a place of practical optimism and of passionate engagement with the most important problems of the world. It is a place that is simply not satisfied until we find the deepest answers. So let me close with one last word of wisdom from da Vinci as he wrote, I had long since observed that people of accomplishment rarely sat back and let things happen to them. They went out and happened to things. That is truly the story of MIT and a formula for inventing the future. We are delighted that you have joined us here to help us write the next chapter in the history of human understanding. And so now I encourage you to go out and happen to things. Welcome to MIT.